MFS, helping mutual fund and institutional investors achieve their financial goals since 1924. MFS. Roll our stockings rolled. God has shown very pretty some of the guns in them. Like, Annie, get your gun. Yeah, we had all that, didn't we, Ann? <laughs> we sure did. And we didn't wear slacks. No, no there slacks. There was no such thing as we slacks. We had our dresses women. were way up over our knees. It's a good thing we had good looking legs. We showed legs. our pretty knees. That's what the song too, really. I had a pretty good pair of gams myself. Me too. <laughs> <Why did you? laughs> yeah, we both did. I still did. have an old lady. And then, like I, I said, we wore our stockings roll, and I had Bob too. And we danced to the Sheik of Araby. <laughs> the Sheik of She bring back old memories to me. Welcome to Boston the way it was. We're back with a second edition of the program that recaptures Boston 50 years ago. It was a time when movies were a dime, a boxing match at the garden, 50 cents, and a cup of joe, just a nickel. It was an era of ward bosses and elevated trains. And back then, who knows? Maybe James Michael Curley himself passed you on this elegant staircase at the Copley Square Library. That was Boston, the way it was. of Norway, right in the middle of Boston. For the first time in its history, the Boston Garden is sold out twice in one day. The fans raise the roof. We know every, every window, every door in the garden, from the roof down, we'd sneak in. We'd, and if we had to pay, we'd pay a quarter to go up the gallery, the gallery, you know, the gallery. And we would hang down to the first balcony, you know, on the, above, on the wings, like on the sides. You bought your ticket in the alley, off the long way, is it, Roger? That's right. You paid, what, 35 cents, Roger? 40 cents. 40 cents for a reserved seat, Roger. But we made our, our way many, many times into Boston Garden and sneaked in certain ways and maybe duke someone a quarter or something like that, you know. And we come in to watch the hockey games, to watch the basketball games, and it was great. And I went to see the boxes like Max Schmeling and uh, Primo Canera. You wouldn't remember them, You guys. watch box boxing, fighting? Yeah. yeah. Sure, the no, boyfriends. That was, that was not me. The boyfriends took us. We had to go where the boyfriends took us, <laughs> no? <laughs> Those days, in the 30s, it was the hockey was the main, main project in the garden. Basketball wasn't even thought of. It's a crowd. They're into it. I mean, you know, this place has been about as noisy as uh, the Grand Canyon with the atomic bomb being dropped into it, I guess, you know? And they're the best bunch of people I've ever been around. Back in 1928, it took four million bucks to build the oldest operating indoor sports arena in the country. It was also the largest in New England. Modeled after the Madison Square Garden, the Boston Garden came to town courtesy of boxing promoter and operator extraordinaire, Tex Rickard. While the 20s were roaring, Rickard was just picking up steam. 
and his dream? To build an entertainment empire for every major city. First came New York, and then Boston. For one solid year, Causeway Street shook as 1,500 cement pillars were driven 50 feet into the ground, rising above North Station, and to this day still rumbling every time a train passes by. The garden's history began with a bang. Maybe it was the warm-up act that opening night 67 years ago. An army private, blindfolded, broke down and reassembled a machine gun in 47 seconds. Or maybe it was the 17,000 Bostonians who paid 10 cents for a program and from 50 cents to $5 for a ringside seat. But whatever it was, the crowd went wild as Honeyboy Finnegan of Dorchester defeated world featherweight champion Andre Routis. In the garden's first decade, it faced the crash, the depression, a Coolidge presidency, and prohibition. But the garden not only survived, the fans couldn't get enough. From rodeos to ice shows, even an indoor ski jump, from three rings to one. Building manager Walter Brown made it his mission to make the garden world class. Although his building was barely breaking even, Brown took risks with his bookings, he knew the name of every usher, and sealed a deal with, what else? A handshake. I uh, appeared in the Boston Garden for 10 straight years. Walter Brown was the president of it, and I never had a contract with Walter Brown. We made a handshake deal, and that was the way we operated. Those days, there was association, no union or anything, you know what I mean? So I think they paid us about a dollar, 10 cents. But you've seen all the shows, you've seen everything. Years ago, we used to take the, the street cat to East Boston and then get on the ferry yeah. for two cents. That's right. And ride the ferry across Atlantic Avenue. I tell you, there's many a times Walk. that I walked from Revere to the Boston Garden because I had just the 40 cents to spend to get into the game. That's all I had well, was Well, hot dogs were what, a dime, Roger, 15 yeah, cents? hot dogs were a dime. Hot dogs were a dime, 15 <clears throat> cents. Well, I don't know about beer, because I never bought beer. It was the Bruins, the team named after this bear cub found on a Boston street corner in the 20s that consistently had the fans filling all the 14,000 seats. Bruins started that garden there, so they thought they were, you know, that was their territory. We used to gather there at 2 o'clock every day. I remember I was still going to school, and uh, the game actually started 8.30 in the evenings. The Herald called the Bruins' opening night a mob scene, a reenactment of the assault on the Bastille. But to future Bruins Hall of Famer, Milt Schmidt, who in 1928 was smacking a puck around a pond in Kitchener, Ontario, the NHL was where he was headed. Schmidt's first season with the Bruins, however, was delayed when manager Art Ross offered him a contract for $2,000, a deal he politely refused. But the following year, 1936, Schmidt was ready to bargain. Mr. Ross offered me a contract for $3,500. And uh, I wanted $500 more, and I didn't have any agent or uh, <clears throat> lawyer to, uh, to help me. And I was only 18 then, and uh, I says, I'm not signing it. Well, he says, well, wait a minute. He says, I'll go see Mr. Charles F. Adams uh, to see whether he'll give $500 more. So he left the office for about five minutes and came back. He's all. Mr. Adams can't uh, see his way clear giving you $500 more. And I says, well, that's it then, so I won't sign it. I says, I'm going home to play junior hockey. And he says, well, wait a minute, Melt. He says, maybe we can make some kind of a deal here. So I don't know what he did or anything like that. And I says, okay, I'll sign it. 
On my way out, I thought, well, I'm going to go in and ask Mr. Adams myself why he wouldn't give this little skinny kid from Kitchener, Ontario, who was weighed about 145 pounds at that time, why he wouldn't give me $500 more, which I did do, and I introduced myself to the secretary. And I said, that told her that I just had signed a contract uh, with the Boston Bruins through Mr. Ross, and uh, I'd like to meet Mr. Adams, the owner of the club. She says, I'm very sorry Mr. Adams isn't in yet. That was my initiation to <laughs> the National Hockey League. After the first goal, the Bruins click again. Slick passing by Milt Schmidt and Ray Garipi opens the way. Rookie Doug Moon scores, and the Bruins down the Leafs 2-1. to one. I would almost think that if I was represented by an agent or a lawyer uh, during those years that I played, I would have been handed the uh, uh, ticket to, to leave town the very next day, sent home, and get out of here. We don't want any part of you. And that's just the way it was. So it wasn't really all that bad. It make, made you work harder, and uh, it was a privilege and an honor in those days to play in the National Hockey League. Rather than working back home for 19 cents an hour in a shoe factory or 25 cents an hour in an ice plant, or 35 cents an hour in a, in a uh, uh, twine factory, and now all of a sudden you're getting $3,500 a year. Nobody else had any money. I had it all. For 16 seasons and 32 years overall with the team, that attitude gained Milt Schmidt the respect of teammates, opponents, and fans. It didn't matter that he had to work for the telephone company in the off season to make ends meet, or that hot and cold towels, along with a tube of Ben Gay, was the extent of his equipment. Milt Schmidt became the most valued, hard-hitting center of the Bruins' famed Kraut line, as it was called. 38, 39, we win the Stanley Cup. 40, or 39, 40. Uh, we finished one, two, three in the scoring race, Bob, Woody, and I, the first time ever. 40-41, we win the Stanley Cup again. We played for the same salary every year. We didn't get a five-cent increase in salary. Uh oh there goes another fight. Milt Schmidt of Boston and Maurice Richard of Montreal. And this time, as they try to break it up, one of the referees hits the ice. This is a rough game from the opening faceoff with violent body checking along with the fights. As a result, the penalty box is jammed. Well, let me say that it wasn't a picnic out in the ice when I played. We didn't have the charging or the hooking or the holding or the interference. They didn't need to. Instead, the Bruins had the Edmonton Express, Eddie Shaw. He was a rough guy. He had, like, they used to count the stitches. Up to that time, he had about 128 stitches at Eddie Shaw. He checked that barely bum. He fractured his skull, and he almost died. It was a matter of uh, living or dying for a long time, and he finally survived. But he had a habit of holding the skate up to the light before the game, and he says, Mr. Green, he says, these skates were not sharpened. Oh, yes, they were, Eddie. He says, I said they were not sharpened. Randall, who was the clubhouse boy, he says, take these skates and go down to the Boston Arena and get them sharpened. Now, in those days, can you imagine the Boston Gardens did not have a skate sharpening machine in there, and they had to jump into a cab and dr drive all the way to the Boston Arena to have the skate sharpened, which he did not do. Randall, or rather, Doc Green told him to sit down the North Station for about 15, 20, half an hour, and he says, then come back, which he did do. And when he came back, he didn't go to the arena at all, and Eddie Shore held his skate up to the light again, and uh, here you are, Eddie. And uh, I can remember and hearing Eddie Shore saying, ah, oh, that's better. No helmets, woolen sweaters, unprotected razor-sharp blades, as if that wasn't enough to contend with during Milt Schmidt's seasons with the Bruins. But there were other things, too, and they were as much a part of the garden as the obstructed views. Well, we suffered considerably uh, in those days due to the fact that if you had a basketball game one night, the ice surface would be taken completely out. And if you had a 
a rodeo with all the dirt that they would bring in our circus. And there was many times uh, that uh, due to the, uh, the ice surface not being maybe an inch thick or an inch and a half, why maybe it was a quarter of an inch in spots. And the trains in those days used to come right underneath while you'd feel the vibration uh, right underneath you. By 1942, the Bruins had won two Stanley Cups, and Milt and the Kraut line were headed for war. The fans really gave us a rough time due to the fact that there, that there were uh, men over there in Europe fighting and losing their lives, and here we were playing hockey. By 1946, a new floor covered the ice in the garden. With post-World War II lumber shortages, an East Boston company fit together small chips of wood, and they called it parquet. With 247 panels, countless brass screws, and 988 bolts, the Bull Gang laid down a piece of garden history. With an average 3,700 fans watching that first season and sellout crowds in seasons to come, the Celtics made the parquet floor their secret weapon. Because there were certain spots where you could dribble and then the ball just wouldn't come back to you. You know, you'd have to lower your hand to get the dribble to get the bounce back, you know, but visiting teams wouldn't know that, you know, and they'd get steered to a certain spot and the ball would go dead. You know? <laughs> You'd either get a traveling call or somebody steal a ball and it'd bounce off your foot and go out of bounds. Boston mayhem is committed in the name of sport. But it was boxing, not basketball or hockey, that the garden was truly built for. And in 1955, a favorite son from the North End made the walls of the garden shake more than any trains ever could. When he the Marco, like. what it was like, uh, it, there's no way of explaining it. When he won, there was cars going on, them people cheering, and a banner put across the street where he lived. Everybody, the highest to the lowest, they all adored him. He won the world championship. Every round was exciting because he won right after the champ and he, he pounded him for 13 rounds till he knocked him out in the 14th round. He just kept after him and he took the heart out of the guy and he knocked him out. He fought, he fought like a lion that night. DeMarco's career began on Fleet Street back in 1947. Because he was only 15, he had to find a way to get a boxing license. So, like a good Italian young man, he turned to his friends and the church. I was three years too young to fight. So therefore, I went to the corner, north end of Boston, Fleet Street, and a few of the guys were there, and I'm looking for someone that was 18 years old. And, and, and sure enough, Tony DeMarco, his name was Lobo, we call him Lobo, came over and I borrowed his birth. I, I told him how old he was. he was. He said he was 18 years old. So then I said, here's what I want you to do. Go to Sacred Heart Church. Father Mario is there. Ask him that you want a birth, uh, a birth record so you can prove that you're 18 years old for, for working purposes. He says, good idea. He said, then give it to me. Father Mario was excited himself. I mean, to think t Tony DeMarco was going, going to work and helping his mother and father. And he said, oh, and he spoke broken English. A nice, a nice a boy. He says, I, I'm a glad, I'm a happy for you. You know, I'm happy for you. And sure enough, he gave him uh, Tony DeMarco's birth certificate. Also, he gave me the birth certificate here. So I began to fight under Tony DeMarco. His name was Antonio DeMarco. <clears throat> and a few fights later, he decided, Tony decided he wanted to fight. So I said, well, fine, but whose, whose name are you going to uh, use? He said, I'm going to use my own. I said, you can't use your name, your own name. I said, because I have it. Go to the car and borrow someone else's name. To many, the garden has been like an old friend. Despite the blackouts, obstructed views, hydroplaning basketball players, 
soaring temperatures, and even rats the size of shoeboxes, the place the Tex built will be missed. We walk in there, it was like home, right, Roger? Uh, it was like being home. It was like being home, you know? And we had a great time. To me now, looking back on it, it was peaceful. Very seldom. Children used to fight and run through the alleys and jump fences. We had, we had a double but door, very... but the outside was never lost. There were black families, there were Lebanese families, Chinese families, 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 families at all times. And we uh, had... we related to everyone in the neighborhood. Everywhere you'd go, there'd be someone who knew who you were and where you were going and would report back well, to your mother. And it, it made us all Your kids were my kids and my kids were your kids, so you to speak. Couldn't you couldn't know. walk through the streets in the South End without saying hi yeah. 50 times. The church, of course, always played a very important part, as it still does today, in keeping the families... Well, well people did talk to each other and so forth. There was more, 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 more as a sort of... You had teachers who things. visited homes. <laughs> never mind calling, but who actually came yeah. into your house to talk you to your mother about If you walked down Trout Avenue on a summer night, you wouldn't miss a word of Walter Winchell. Everybody's window was open. Everybody was out in the street, but everybody's window was open, and the radio was on, and Walter Winchell. Good evening, Mr. and Mrs. North and South America, and all the ships and clippers at sea. Let's go to Boston, Massachusetts. The condition of Franklin Delano Roosevelt, Jr., who was hurt today in a motor car crash near Walpole, Massachusetts, is not serious. In the mid-1800s, the elegant bow-front row houses of the South End were home to mostly middle-class and even some Brahmin families. But when the Cathedral of the Holy Cross was constructed on Washington Street, the Brahmins knew it was time to go. They headed for the Back Bay and Beacon Hill, replacing them with the Irish. But since they couldn't afford to keep up the homes themselves, these new landlords turned the townhouses into rooming houses and changed the landscape of the South End for the next hundred years. By 1900, the streets of the neighborhood resembled New York's Lower East Side. Working people of all races and religions, living side by side, all looking for what the South End had to offer, an affordable place to live. In the South End, you had a wonderful mixture of races and cultures and all kinds of people and all economic levels. I mean, there were, there were people living in single rooms and in little apartments and what have you, and there were people who lived in five-story townhouses as single homes. I remember by the time, what, I was six, seven years old, most of the kids, my peers, we could all swear in six or seven different languages, Greek, Armenian, Italian, uh, Irish, Arabic. So you had Near Eastern peoples, you had some blacks and, and whites and had a variety of, uh, of, uh, of uh, incomes and so forth. That, that's, that's one of the characteristics of, of, of the area. People cared about one another. You knew the people next door and you knew the people across the street. And if anybody was having a crisis, people tried to find a way to help. Somebody lost their job, and you know people would arrive with casseroles and loaves of bread or whatever they were fixing for their family. If somebody got sick, one of your neighbors would come in and help to take care of them. If you weren't home and your children were, somebody scooped us up, <laughs> took us in. I mean, there was a much more uh, mutual support 
and concern, and you knew everybody. I mean, you knew everybody in the neighborhood, and they knew you. It was this everyday living that artist and South End resident Alan Kreit wanted to show in his paintings, some of which hang in the Smithsonian. I just want to show black people, just ordinary people, living ordinary lives, and, uh, and nothing more dramatic than that. Because I remember when you had the bow front houses all the way down. There's a reproduction of a painting on my child Hassam. He must have been standing right outside this house here, looking towards, uh, looking towards downtown. And uh, that gives you an idea of what, uh, what the South End was like. Fifty years ago, the South End had a large transient community living in cold water flats or walk-ups. But there was another way to live affordably and help pay a mortgage, by taking in rumors. We had a woman named Ethel Woods who lived with us uh, at one point for several years. Yes, a lot of people did that, especially uh, single women or single men were usually housed with a family more so than even than in rooming houses. There was an old Irish woman lived up in a small side room in our house and her name was uh, Mrs. Mrs. Cullane. Cullane. Yeah. And next to her was an old German man who had really gone undercover during World War II uh, because his name was Julius Dinzer and he was very German looking and was very fearful. But when Mrs. Cullane died penniless in that room and my family didn't have anything, Julius Dinza gave his grave to that woman. It was the most incredible thing. But a, house, a room, you know, a big room like this was a dollar and a half a week and your small room was maybe 50 cents. If the idea of rumors sounds like a throwback, remember the weekly visits from the ragman, the knife sharpener, the ice man? From the West End to the South End, the sound of their carts on the cobblestones brought neighbors together, sometimes to bargain, sometimes to gossip. Any ice today, ladies? Any ice today, ladies? How about a little peace today? Don't you think you ought it? It's only for a quarter. How much is your box? How much do you need? Other lady next door, she likes it a lot. 50 cents that she would ask is not very much, but 50 cents a quarter. What's the difference, don't you order? How big is your box, my dear? I never heard that one. <laughs> well, they'd come down and uh, sell you a piece, 10 cents a piece, a quarter piece, you know, 35 cent piece, and um, people would buy there their rice and uh, for the their ice box. Frenchie was very unhappy. My mother was one of the last ones to get a refrigerator. And he was very unhappy with her <laughs> when she finally did. He wouldn't talk to her for a long time. People would go down the, the, the alleys, uh, hurry, eggs and box, rags and box. And he was, they were trying to buy rags and bottles. It was the first. Uh, effort to recycle. <laughs> and <laughs> we had a nice box at that time, so he knew the size, and my mother would just let him in. We had a rag bin. He used to come in, and we had the bag out in the yard, and he used to weigh it. And then give you a few pennies. The ice men would come along and holler ice, <laughs> and the ladies would stick their heads out the window and say, "Give me a five cent piece." <laughs> and the kids would chase the wagon and get all the chips, especially on a hot day. You know, they suck the ice. It's no before the game. 
and we had to clear the field, and we were all tense and worried about the game because we, our, our season was we had won four, lost four, and tied one. And BC was the national champs. They had won eight straight, you know, and there were rumors that they were going to play in the Sugar Bowl after they killed us. But it didn't work out that way. Holy Cross made one touchdown after another. By the end of the Near the end of the game, the score was 55 to 6 before BC made their second touchdown. And then, of course, the score was 55 to 12. And following the games, we all hell broke loose in the locker room, and we, we couldn't believe that we had done what we did. BC was scheduled to go to, uh, to Coconut Grove for, 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 to celebrate, but when they lost the game, they decided instead to go to the Statler, and they spent the night at the Statler. Some of the Holy Cross players were also scheduled to go to uh, uh, Coconut Grove, but in, they got an invitation from the mayor of Boston at that time, Morris Tobin, he was having a party at the Parker House, and he invited the whole Holy Cross squad. So that's where we went to the Parker House. Many people said it was an act of God that the Holy Cross celebration was elsewhere on the night of November the 28th, 1942, and that the Boston College players ended up canceling their celebration at the famed South End nightclub, the Coconut Grove. A lot of uh, uh, dinners were held there to boys who were going overseas. And that was customary at the time. We'd have a party, and you'd go to the Coconut Grove and have a party for one of the boys. As you came inside, you go up a couple of steps, if I'm remembering right. Yes, you're right. And there was the bar there. That's right. And then the dancing floor, and there was a roof over the dancing floor that That's would right. open. That's right. And that you could dance under the stars. The Coconut Grove. Uh, all the best entertainment was around at the time. Everybody went there. I mean, all the young people who were dating went there. And, you, and you'd see the same people that you saw other places. I mean, if you went to Latin Quarter, you might see the same people that you saw at the Grove week, the, the week before. The Melody Lounge was a place where young people met and had a drink and before or after a show or something like that. And it was, it was very popular. I really had fun there. And uh, it was crowded. It was always crowded. The whole building was called the Coconut Grove because there were fake palm trees scattered all around in, in corners, which <laughs> didn't mean very much, but, but they were there. And in the Melody Lounge, there was a palm tree in the two rear corners. There was nothing showing. There's no was no fire showing in front of the no fire showing. Now this is the Broadway side. There was no fire showing. Heavy smoke rising upward, but no head, no fire. So I took my wife by the arm and we went further into the kitchen. And uh, by and now we were just about alone. And I didn't know where we were going, but I just we just had to get away from number one the crowd and number two the smoke and number three the fire which now was approaching and as we got deeper into the kitchen i don't know how but i looked up and i just saw a window uh you know near the, it was near the ceiling because we were underground now and um there was a table nearby and i pushed the table under the uh under the window. I pushed the window open and I pushed my wife out um, and I followed her out. I believe it was started when some customer flipped a cigarette over and didn't stub it act actively enough in this thing, which was quite dry. 
and uh, it, it quickly caught fire. And then I could watch as the flames came over the ceiling towards me and then towards the back of the room. In less than 15 minutes, the fire and smoke that engulfed the coconut grove would claim 492 lives. Most of them died from inhaling fumes of burning plastic decorations. It was the second worst single building fire in American history. At the Grove that night was cowboy movie star Buck Jones. He was among the hundreds treated at area hospitals with a new experimental drug, penicillin. But nothing short of a miracle could save him and so many others. What was learned from the tragedy would soon be put to use in a war that many BC and Holy Cross players would fight. They did learn a lot from the, from the fire of how to treat burns. And of course, with the war on coming on our hands, this become a valuable asset to the, uh, to the military. One week after uh, uh, we had the game, uh, we were back in school, and uh, three months later, we were all in the service. Garfield Plaza Hotel, Boston. Time, 2.30. So you have to remember that these clubs, this one and most of the others, were all set up at about the same time when the back bay was developed and the hill was developed. There was no radio, no television, no automobiles. Nobody could go anywhere. And they organized all these clubs for different purposes. Remy. Well, the reason for the Sons of Italy is to hold the Italian people together, to, you know, like every other organization. And the membership read like the, like the social register. There wasn't any unsuspecting person on, on the, in the membership. Really extraordinary. Now, they were all much the same. You look at the, the same people belong to the Contemporary Club, they belong to the Tennis Club, and the Somerset Club, and the Tavern Club. The Professional and Businessmen's Club was just that. It was made up of black uh, businessmen. It was a private membership club, but it had a bar downstairs that was open to the public, so you could run into all kinds of people there. If you want to be put up for membership, you, I would let this book out, and people would mark the people they knew who would write letters for their, to support their membership. And, uh, and they were all just like the others, I mean, Forbes's and Adams's and, and Ames's and whatever not. Well, the Hendricks Club was a political club that was organized by Martin Lamasty. As the immigrants would come off the boat, particularly from Ireland, he would meet them at the boat and settle them and get them jobs. And there they were endeared to him for the rest of their lives. There were all these people who wanted to belong who just didn't quite make it. Well, this is the Brahmin Brahmin Brahmin. I mean, they were uh, absolutely, they were the new Brahmins. If there is an art to being a Brahmin, then David Crockett has painted the masterpiece. Crockett was born Brahmin and bred Brahmin. His canvas, a life filled with summers on the shore and lunches in the city. At where else? The oh so private social clubs of Boston. Crockett has never been a member of just one club. He frequents and is welcome at them all. The earliest clubs in Boston were the dining clubs, popular during the 18th century. Then came the social clubs, as the Brahmins lost their political power with the election of the first Irish mayor. These clubs were a place where like-minded folk could meet and greet, as well as dine in style. You always want to get room C, you know, because it, it, it was faced, it looked out over Boston Common. 
They were beautiful rooms, a beautiful uh, decor. Clubs in Boston weren't only for the well-to-do, however. Ethnic clubs were as much a part of the neighborhoods as the trolley car. We also had a lot of fun clubs. Uh, the Hibernian Hall that Bernard talks about was a place that I went dancing. It was a place that I knew I could meet Irish girls. But there were indeed differences. A visit to the Sons of Italy and a visit to the Union Club tell the story. The Union Club was always a little below the salt, a little bit below the salt. The Union Club was founded, you know, originally because when the Union forces marched down Beacon Street, you know that story, the Somerset Club pulled out all their shades. Well, the reason they pulled out the shades is the same reason they pull them down now, is the sun was pouring in. But they, <laughs> a bunch of the members decided it was an offense at the, uh, uh, at the troops, you see, and they were against the Civil War. The membership of the Somerset Club were in trade with England, and they didn't like this one bit. The cotton business was being ruined by the Civil War. So that they, they this bunch got together and, formed, and bought that house on Park Street and formed the Union Club. Bailey Aldrich was given his membership in the Union Club by his father as he graduated from Harvard Law School 63 years ago. There were several members there that liked lunching at the Union Club and we had a table in the, what was known as the Grouch's Room. Uh, what we grouched about mostly was people coming in and being uh, ob obvious in their conversation. We liked to be nice and quiet, and particularly there was to be no smoking in the grouchers' room. Hey, hey go hey, swear hey, it. What do you think you are, church? Tilly, <laughs> <laughs> catch. All day. All day. You got none of Half of us are retired, half are on vacation. No, the other half are tired. <laughs> Six. It's the Sons of Italy, uh, 208 uh, Lodge, one of the oldest lodges in the country, and it might be the oldest one in Boston, close to it. When Joe Coppola opened this branch of the Sons of Italy on Endicott Street, he was carrying on a tradition that goes back before he was a boy, a time when the North End was as Italian as a village in the old country, and new immigrants needed someone to pave the way. The purpose in the beginning was for that, to help the immigrants, to get them jobs, or, you know, union, because they were discriminated against. It's not no uh, secret about that. As for the rules of the club, well, there's not many, and even the most important ones seem negotiable. Well, you have to be an Italian to be a member, because it's the Sons of Italy. You could be half Italian, half Irish, but the Italian name is the, the, the father's name, and you could be a member. See? Now, you have to be Italian to be a member or married to an Italian. If your wife is an Italian, she could be a member. If your wife is Italian, you could be a member. Now, as far as anybody being adopted by Italians, I don't know how that works, but it should be that once you're adopted, you're Italian. Gives me somewhere to go and meet the fellas and talk and play cards and get away from my wife for a few hours. Then I go home with a clear head. <laughs> the knock then was made up all clubs. Now they're becoming restaurants. There ain't too many left. It's becoming uh, obsolete clubs. So we just happen to have the Sons of Italy, which is indestructible. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're one of us. <laughs> <laughs> Mamma mia. What do I do? Come on, let's go. Last night, body opened here at the Ritz Carlton Hotel from Boston for a year and a half. In 1927, when the Ritz-Carlton first opened, it also seemed more like a private club than a hotel. Fashioned after the Paris Ritz, the owner granted rooms only to those listed in the social register. And during the Depression, he ordered all of the lights on in vacant rooms, lest the public think that the Ritz was suffering. Martha Johnson Walters and Simon Devine have been coming to the Ritz over 60 years. To them, it is the ultimate Boston club. There oh, were sure. many That's people right. banned from the Ritz. Yeah. Because and celebrities, too. Absolutely. Because of their behavior. Difference. 
uh, if they didn't behave the way they should, they weren't allowed back again. But in those days when the roof opened, the only tall building that you could see in Boston was the Custom House Tower. And now that is surrounded by all skyscrapers, so you can't mm. even see it from the roof. You know, you tell any young person going to the roof now, they find it hard to believe you. That's right. That's life. Life is changes. There are some of us you just can't get rid of, though. Yeah. We stay on and on. Movies usually were double headers, two at a, at a time, with uh, oftentimes some vaudeville acts in, in between. And they had giveaways, they had nights when you went uh, 20 weeks in a row and got a different dish each time. That was where we really spent uh, our Saturday afternoons. It probably cost a nickel or a dime to get in. When we were kids, we would go to the Bowdoin for 10 cents. Stay there all day because they had cereal pictures and you wanted to know what happened to Pearl White on the railroad track when the train was coming. See, and then it would end. So you waited to see whether or not. So you'd sit there. Your mothers gave you lunch because it was a good way to get rid of you. And you'd sit there all day waiting to see what the, whether the train was going to run her over. cost a nickel but I love the cereals on Saturday but where my mother had five children that was five nickels so what she did was go to the movie this Saturday you didn't go next Saturday but you could probably go the following Saturday oh sure the change, movies change every every uh no every three days or something like that I guess Cowboys and Indians were the important. They, they, they were the important movies in those days. Oh yes, they were the big things. Cowboys and the United States cows were always on time. Just come in the nick of time to save the people from all the Indians. The poor old Indians, though, when I look back, took an awful look at <laughs> The Bowdoin Square, Theater Bowdoin Square. We sat on wooden benches in the gallery. We used to call it the gallery. Why would you call it Because we didn't know the word gallery. We said the gallery. Even when we heard the word ga gallery, by that time we were so used to call it the gallery that we still call it the gallery. And used to get it for a quarter, a dime. We dressed to go to the movies, didn't we always dress? Oh, yes. We dressed from We dressed to go to, to church in those days, and we dressed to go to the movies. And Sunday night, my family was the lowest state on uh, Mass Avenue in town. We went there all the time because they were very, it was like a fashion show. Oh, yeah. Well, the cute part was trying to get out of school or not go to school and get into the theater and see a show without the truant officer showing up and running you out of there. <laughs> One fellow would buy a ticket, go in, open the door, and 15, 20 kids would come in the door. <laughs> I remember the manager, Mac, he used to be caught us sneaking into the movie, you know, we'd, we'd get real mad try to get mad at us, you know. And, oh, I'd line up, I'm gonna take a picture, and it'd go like that, you know, like I'm doing, like, okay, you got uh, the scare, don't come back, we'll get your pictures, don't try to sneak in here again, you know. Escapism was the order of the day. If it hadn't been for the movies, the 30s and 40s would have been a sorrier time in America. For a dime or a quarter, a trip to the local movie house bought a double feature, a cartoon, even an hour-long stage show at some theaters. 
To start things off was a newsreel. In the days before television, this was how people got their information. Paris, August 22nd, 1944. The only way you got in touch with the radio, you listened to the radio, they had news, and then when you went to the movies, they had the Pathé newsreel, you know, and you'd watch what happened like three days ago. Today, the, they'd be laughed at because they were done uh, days or sometimes weeks before, so they weren't news. If a, a battle was being shown a week later, it wouldn't make any difference. It was still, uh, still the same. It is barely dawn. The troops have not yet landed on the beaches. In Boston, the centerpiece of the movie houses was the Metropolitan. Today, it is known as the Wang Center. But when it opened back in 1925, the Met was the showplace, called the Cathedral for Motion Pictures. On opening night, 20,000 Bostonians stood in line to get a peek at the theater that was modeled after the Paris Opera Comique. People craned their necks to look at the elaborate ceiling murals, marble columns hand-painted with gold leaf, and chandeliers dripping with crystal. Theaters were grand during those years, you know. Um, I don't really think they were built, honestly, to look at them to be movie theaters, to be honest with you, but they were so nicely done, you know. You'd walk in and, you, you know, and right away your eyes would go upward, you know, because you're amazed at the fixture and the texture of the building. At the Metropolitan, the architecture was part of the show. If the Grand Lobby looks palatial, well, it should. It was patterned after the Palace of Versailles. In an era of opulence, the Met quickly became the piece de resistance. The Boston Herald exclaimed that the theater was gaiety with gold, comfort with crimson. An air-conditioned comfort at that. Wafting out from under the 4,200 seats was cool air. All of this extravagance cost $8 million to build. But the Met wasn't just for movies. A full-fledged stage show came first. An orchestra ascended from the pit, a hundred-voice chorus, and an immense Wurlitzer rose into view. All of this before name entertainers like George Burns and Gracie Allen would come on. Crosby is the one they want to hear. Oh, Pooter Crosby. You're twice the singer he is. I know, but he's the one they want to hear. All right. <laughs> they can't understand why. All he ever sings is White Christmas. They ever changed the color of Christmas he threw. <laughs> then there was the visit from the hot throb of the day, Rudy Valley. Just as he was beginning his solo sax rendition of Give Me Something to Remember You By. They hit him with a grapefruit. Some kids from Harvard didn't like him. They hit him with a grapefruit. My time is your time. Yeah, yeah, that was your it. time is my time. time. We just seem to synchronize and sympathize. We're harmonizing one step. They won't be able to throw grapefruit at me with this machine, will they? No, they certainly won't. The movie houses, the clubs, the grove, the old neighborhood, the Boston Garden. Some of these places are just faded memories. Others are still with us, bringing the past into the present. But remembering what they meant to us, and how they enriched our lives, teaches us other things 
about a time and a place and the people who live there, about Boston, the way it was. We've been here all our lives. We've been here all our lives. I lived in the building next door 52 years. We've been on this corner all our lives. I've been here, I was born, I was actually born on Salem Street, nobody knows, next to the fire station. And I swear I can remember the horses pulling the, the wagon. Do you remember? No. You're too young. You horses, were born here. No, when you're, no. They didn't have horses you're and too wagons. You're too young. No, they did, in, in that fire station. That fire station didn't have horses and wagons. That, that ain't too long ago. 73 years ago, that ain't that long. Soon will come a day when youth will pass away. Then what will they say about me? These are just, oh, shucks, I forgot the end of it. Yeah, yeah. Just a gigolo, and life goes on without me. It's true. Time is like a story that you've not read before. New beginnings fresh on every page. Now is the time to take a chance, give it your all once more. Go for a bullseye double top, hit, hit center stage. Time is like a change in seasons long awaited for. Like a sunny day, the first in spring. No rain, no clouds, no feeling gray. Everything's fine, we're on our way. So be smart, be wise, be straight, be right, be hip. Changes are here to stay. Look sharp, look bright, look out, look cool, look out. It's gonna go our way. No rain, no clouds, no feeling gray. Everything's fine, we're on our way. So be smart, be wise, be straight, be right, be hip. Changes are here to stay. Look sharp, look bright, look out, look cool, look out. It's gonna go our way. MFS, providing stock, bond, tax-free, and money market mutual funds through financial advisors.